Okay. Yeah. There are a little bit of uh, some technicalities there, but we are so thankful. The Lord is good. And we want to greet everyone who has joined and those of us who are listening. We want to welcome you to um, Courtship and Marriage Seminar, which we'll be having this particular weekend um, that begins this evening all through to Sunday. And so we are so glad to have you all here uh, joining to learn together how you should be able to live both as young people and also as old people who are already in their marriage uh, dedication and commitment. And we are hoping that you'll be able to learn lesson after lesson and be, um, be blessed. So everyone uh, feel welcome, uh, Karibu Sana, or any one of us, including those of us who are not coming uh, from any place locally. I am sure that as time continues, the Lord will continue to speak to us in a special way. So yeah, um, I want us to enter into the study, the first lesson, and then we'll be able to um, find time, of course, to um, interact, ask questions, and we we'll receive answers as the Bible will be directing us, and the spirit of prophecy. Our two books, key uh, sources that we'll be using, the Bible especially, because the Bible is a solution to all life's problems. So let's pray, and then after prayer, we'll be able to begin. So wherever you are, I'll be looking down. We will mute you. Uh, maybe the host will mute you so that you can uh, with, a, with a recording. Okay, so let's pray and then we'll, be, we'll get started. Let's pray. Okay. Our Father and our God in heaven, you're so thankful you gather us here together. You want to hear what you're saying to us. You have come from different places and what you want to hear is your voice that you may shape our families. You may shape our youth, that we may be in our conduct and department, honor and glorify you. Bless us, Lord, that after these meetings, we might truly come to have an experience with Jesus Christ. Well, this is our prayer in Jesus Christ's most holy name. Amen. Now, allow me to uh, start by saying that um, we are living in an age and time where we are having a confused marriage um, marriage commitments. I mean, we are having um, what I would call confusion in our marriages. And we are living in a time where there are a lot of strange things happening all over the world. And these things are breaking down the family uh, relations. Uh, media is one of the great things that is actually breaking the family relations. Uh, what I've come to understand is media has made us close yet far away from one another. You can be in the same house with your children, but they are not really in your house. They are actually closer to those who are very far away from them. And not only that, media can actually make you very far from your very own wife, your very own husband, where you are in the same house, but unfortunately you are far from one another. Why far from one another? Because you are on WhatsApp and you're chatting with so-and-so and chatting with so-and-so and you are on Messenger and you're on Twitter and you're on uh, Instagram and all these things. And I mean, we are living in a time when marriage relations are facing a huge chunk of challenges. And so if there is an issue that needs to be addressed in the last days is the institution of marriage. Why? Because the institution of marriage is given by God, where? In the Garden of Eden. And it was given just before God was able to rest together with the couple in the Sabbath. And so I think that as we restore the Sabbath, we must restore the marriage. And we'll find that there's a close relationship between marriage and guess what? A close relationship between marriage and the commandments of God. We'll be able to find that, especially the fourth commandment, because God created man and woman. And then after that, God united them. God organized a marriage ceremony, what I would call a wedding ceremony. And that wedding, uh, uh, both of them were able to commit themselves supremely to love God and to love one another. 
and then they began living together. And after a few uh, hours, we are told that the Sabbath was welcomed, and the couples together with the Father and the Son and the holy angels in heaven were able to partake of that special token of rest. So that was really amazing and something that I would love us to consider why we need to restore the marriage relations. It's so important. It's closely ties to the Sabbath message. And that's something that we need to think about. Now, what is the solution to all these marriage problems in the world? Now, there is a time that I thought that the solution to marriage problems or relationship problems or courtship problems was in a particular segment of guess, uh, I think a particular segment of um, the daily newspapers. And so you'd like run to some section of the daily newspaper and find a large chunk of stuff written there. And many people are like, I think if I dedicate myself to re reading these portions, I'll have better uh, relationship or better marriage. So while I was in college, people were reading a lot of love magazines. They were reading a lot of new papers on love and so on. And they were like, I think if I read this well enough, I could be able to practice it in my marriage. It could be good enough. I think some people were dedicated to watching soap operas. I, I'm going to tell you that I love soap opera. I know that someone might be saying, man, you, are you saying a man loves soap opera? That's exactly, I think, I love to watch soap opera. We used to watch it. And let me tell you one thing. Many people think that by watching a lot of these uh, uh, um, movies that are filled with the uh, love, sex, sentimentalism, then we would form better relationships better marriages, better families. And they look at these families and they're like, I want to be like that family. I want to be like this. And so they've made media their teacher. They've made media a source of their education. And you know what happens? They have been disappointed. So media has disappointed us uh, from all its source. All right. So we have come to a point where people are asking themselves, what's the solution to marriage problems? Some people have thought maybe if we go and exchange vows from the attorney's office, and that's all right, then we think that we'll be forever bound. We can never be separated. Let me tell you, that's another fallacy that is spreading all over. And unfortunately, the more they exchange the vows before the attorney, the more marriages are breaking. I'll tell you, there are loads of marriages that are broken. I just want to share my screen to be able to help you all uh, from um, whatever it is that we're going through. And I just want you to imagine that, um, I just want you to imagine that the more that these marriages are contracted, the more they fail. And why is this? It's because people have not found the true source of family unity, whereby we are born together with cords of love that can never be broken, can never be broken by poverty, can never be broken by uh, any disagreement in the house, can never be broken by any of these factors that have led to divorce and breakages in family. And a beautiful book that I love, Adventist Home, and we'll be able to read, it says that uh, the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of all life's problems. How many? All of life's problems can be solved by the gospel. The economy of this country can be solved by the gospel. Um, uh, um, issues to do with uh, marriage can be solved by the, by, 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 by the Bible, the gospel. Issues to do with the pandemic crisis. All these things, diseases, they can be solved by the gospel. So the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of all life's problems. So if we study the scriptures, the spirit of prophecy, and bring its principles into our relationships, into our families, then we can be sure that we will find solutions to all our problems. Now, it doesn't matter how bad your situation has been. The presentations that we'll be doing this weekend are not meant to condemn, but rather to educate. And so it doesn't matter how bad your situation could have been. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you have made. We are doing these lessons to help young and old people to make decisions for Jesus Christ. 
to make their homes and their relationships something that can picture the love between the father and his only begotten son, something that the world can admire. So that if even so worldlings visit our homes, they can truly say that over truth, the home of this brother or the home of this sister or the home of both of these is actually little heaven down here. That is what all of us want. We want a home that is going to be little heaven down here. That's what I want. I am sure that's what you want. And yet, how are we going to do it? What's the backbone? What is the backbone of a true relationship that can last? A true relationship where the cords that bind you, that need you to your partner can never be broken from courtship all the way to marriage because marriage is courtship continued. Uh, marriage is, our uh, courtship is preparation for marriage. And you also realize that marriage is a continuation of courtship. We'll be able to, of course, courtship as a few privileges that are denied to the people who are interacting. And then marriage, in marriage, those privileges are added, but then it's a continuation of courtship. But you will realize that most people, instead of continuing with courtship <laughs> in their marriage, they fail terribly. And you know why they fail? It's because their courtship was formed or laid on a wrong foundation. So if the foundation is wrong, it doesn't matter how much you try to build the structure <clears throat> on top. The foundation, I know from my simple um, engineering class, that uh, uh, the foundation is a very important section of the entire uh, uh, construction. And so I think that you can have a good, uh, a good structure, a beautiful structure built of stone, good roofing, all these things. Uh, the substructure partially could be good, but if the foundation is wrong, and the Bible says, if the foundations be destroyed, then what shall the righteous do? So we don't want to destroy the foundation because the foundation which you are setting right now as a young person, the foundation and all of us are young in one sense because we will be older after this presentation. And so I want to say the foundation you are setting today will determine what it will be like in the end. Of course, the end justifies the means. Most of the marriages are broken, justified to a larger extent, not in every extent, the foundation which was laid during courtship and during engagement and marriage. And so that's vitally important. And I speak about these things. I am not very old, but I want every one of us to understand that this is a very important matter. And why this thing actually troubled me, troubled my friends who will be speaking here, I will say of, of, of a surety is because I have been receiving a lot of phone calls personally. And it means that marriage problems is not just a problem for those who have not received Christ. Marriage problems is a problem even for many people who are in the, I mean, who have received Christ. In fact, let me say even among present truth believers, those who believe the truth for this time, they have marriage difficulties. And the reason is, um, we have not gone back to the scripture and studied the Bible, the gospel well enough to be a solution to all these problems. I'll give you one story why I know that this is a very important subject. A friend of mine, and I think I was doing a week of prayer somewhere. And um, while I was doing the week of prayer, um, I had to spend some time to speak and pray with people. And so while I was speaking and praying with people, some young sister came into uh, uh, whatever the office where I was. And this young sister told me that, you know what, brother, um, I am so thankful that you are here. And I want to share with you just a few burdens that I'm going through in my family. The, the lady was about 25 or 26. She entered a marriage and she's telling me that, you know what, um, brother, uh, my husband shouted at me the very night after we wedded. And while you are at hotel, in an Adventist hotel, in the morning, while you are just moving into the breakfast table, my husband shouted at me again. And before we could go along, in about three nights, my husband had beat me. My husband had beat me. He had attempted to break my phone. 
and I asked my husband to give me fare so that I can return to my mother. And just imagine it was not a week and the husband had done that. What had happened in that short space of time? The sister tells me that the husband was a believer, in fact, a preacher on a Seventh-day Adventist pulpit. And she tells me that occasionally the husband would even beat her with a bucket of water. And at the same time, the husband would ask her, hey, do some devotion. And it could continue and continue and continue. And he would still go and get a pulpit and preach. These things are happening. And so we are not dealing with a problem that is only found among us non-believers, heathens. No, this is a problem that is found in men among us believers. Men and women who share pulpits are having problems in their marriages. This is why I think one of the most neglected subject is the subject of courtship and marriages. I'm not sure why it's neglected, but I think it's time that God would be able to set for us a proper foundation <laughs> that without a home church, without a home devotion, there cannot be devotion in the church. Without unity in the home church, there cannot be devotion to unity in the <clears throat> congregational church outside there. And so it all begins at home. If there is love at home between the wife and the children and, uh, and, and the entire family that makes up that home, you can be sure that family that love one another coming together will be a grand church that loves one another. And we can experience then what we call the latter rain because the early rain was only received upon the unity of the disciples. And so I believe that for there to be a latter rain, family relations must be restored. As the Elijah mission states that in the last days, the hearts of the fathers will be returned to that of the children and that of the children to the fathers. There will be a restoration of family relations. You need to understand that before the end of this world's issue, right? So that's very important, like never before, a subject that we need to understand. Now, we are able to see that Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 did not only talk about the judgment, Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 is very special. Why is it very special? Because Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 talks about something happening in heaven. And you know what that is? It's the judgment, the beginning of the judgment in heaven. Solemn sins begin to pass before the Father and the Son. Angels are taking records. And it's written, no one knows. <clears throat> soon, no, uh, 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 soon, no one knows how soon our names may be called and the judgment may end. And so if that's the situation of how things are in heaven, how ought we to be careful in relation to even the words we utter in our courtship, the interaction we have with our partners in our courtship, the way we handle our wives and our husbands in our marriage, we ought to be very careful. Now, why am I saying that? It's because the home religion or the home experience is always to a larger extent separated from the religious experience. All right, I can talk the way I like with my wife, but then on Sabbath, I can be able to appear in church and just act like an elder. You understand what I'm talking about? All right, when I can do everything the way I want at home, but when I come to church, I'll do things a little bit differently. No. In fact, the home makes the background, the backbone of a true religious family. So the home is very important. So it's why you realize that the sanctuary will be uh, teaching us a lot of consecration as we enter into a marriage re relationship with our uh, uh, with Jesus Christ. The church enters into a marriage relationship with Jesus Christ. Because let me just take you a little bit into prophecy before I go deep into this. Now, you see Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 and um, maybe, I don't know, but uh, I'm sure that chapter 25, I don't know, you can remind me, Brother Sammy, but chapter 25 of Matthew, that's the marriage and it's shown as happening in 1844, isn't it? And so I think that the church must make some steps from the outer court as it nears what we call the most holy place. And in the most holy place, there is a marriage. And you know what happens in the most holy place? 
is the most holy place we enter because now we are seeing the law of God and we uphold the law of God above everything in our lives. Now, realize what the Bible says. I'll share with us a few Bible verses if I go to the slides. What does the Bible say in the book of uh, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26? This will be interesting. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26. And I have read this verse, and it's a verse I love. But it says, my son, give me your word. Give me thine art. And let thine eyes observe my ways. Wow. So there is something so special that God is asking from us as youths, as young people and old people. What is it? Your heart. So before you give your heart to someone, you need to give your heart to God. God says, my son, give me your heart. And then the Bible says, then after you've given me your heart, then your eyes will observe my ways. So the first thing we have to understand is submitting our hearts to God. We must give our hearts, not to man, not to your girlfriend, not to your boyfriend, not to wherever you find in the colleges where you are, in your workplace where you are, and we realize the difference between dating and calling really, because the first person who needs to receive our hearts is Jesus Christ. If Christ does not receive your heart, you have no business committing your heart to another person. No, it will end up in break, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, disappointments, heartbreaks. And I have seen a lot of ladies who are crying because they have been miserably broken. And you know why? Because they fell in love. Christians don't fall in love. They rise to love. You need to understand that. Why is it that they rise to love? Because they don't love by accident. They don't randomly love. They don't bump into just loving people because love to them is a principle. It's, a, it's something that is premeditated. They meditate about it. They pray about it. They think about it and say, God, I want to now commit myself to someone because you have shown me after my prayers that I need to. And so I am sure that you direct me. So I am not just making some others that moves, bumping into ladies in the car, bumping into people in the cafeteria and so on. This is not what God is calling us into, my friends. What God is calling us is something so high. And that's what we want to understand. So give me your heart. Now, I want to give you something so important that God calls us to do. He says, the greatest of all the commandments is found in Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. I just want to read about three verses or chapters or so. And then we Mark chapter 12. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says in Mark chapter number 12. And um, you can begin reading with me from verses number 29. Uh, and Jesus answered and said unto him, the first of all the commandments, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Verse 30 says, and therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. So the first and the most important thing is having understood that there is one God, you must love God with all your heart. So how much is all your heart? All your heart means all your heart. So by the way, if you surrender a half of your heart to God, you cannot surrender the whole of it to your wife, to your girlfriend. I I'm telling you the truth. If you surrender three quarters of your heart to God, you can never commit on the pulpit and with your heart that from this day, I will be faithful to this brother, to this sister, all through our life till that do us part. I'll be faithful to him in disease. I'll be faithful to her in, in struggles of poverty and so on. Because you have never learned what is called complete submission. You've never learned to surrender your heart. So if you are truly honest, you should say to the preacher, you know what, preacher? You are asking me something that I've never known how to do. I've never known how to love wholeheartedly. I have never known it. And so I cannot do it. If anything, even in my youth, I didn't know what it means to be faithful. So you are asking me something that I cannot do. 
I mean, I am just, I mean, what, what's happening is I am exchanging vows with this sister because she comes at this particular point. But it's not because I think I will commit myself to this sister or to this brother all the days of my life because I have never learned to do it. My eyes have never learned to stay on one lady. My commitment have never learned to stay on one woman. And so I don't think it's going to be possible. But then God says the first and the most important is love God with how much? With all your heart. And then it says, and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. So are you telling me that our mind, our thoughts, our ideas, all this must be committed to loving God? Yes. But then the Bible says, uh, <clears throat> and the second one is like this, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandments. Should I speak about that a little bit? Yes, I can speak about that. That did you know that if you've never learned to this called love to your neighbors, and you can read it in the Good Samaritan story, where this man asked, who is your neighbor? And Jesus told him of a story of a Samaritan who actually helped a Jew who was actually wounded. Who was a Jew to a Samaritan? <clears throat> the Jews could not even exchange water, drinking water with the Samaritans. But just imagine the Samaritan went and actually took care of the Jew who was wounded. In fact, if you've studied very well, the Samaritan even spent his money, his money to do what? To be able to treat that particular Jew. That is the far he went and then Jesus said, that's exactly who your neighbor is. And so what I want to say is that this is vitally important. Very, very important. Welcome. Very, very important. Why is it important? Because we have to love our neighbor. Love God first, then love our neighbor. If anyone did not understand this principle of embankment, of true relationship, they can never know what it means to love their wives. So that's why you realize that a small thing happens and they're like, I don't think it can continue. I don't think we can continue staying together. I don't think we shall continue interacting, okay? All these nasty things are going all around because we don't have a practical Christian experience. We have never learned in our lives even to love those who hated us. And so the moment your wife just um, annoys you or says something that is wrong, you're already up there and you're accusing her and you're doing all these things, it's because you've never learned to, I mean, bear along in all these things. And so that's very important, the backbone. All right, now, did you know that the Bible says also that Jesus Christ, he came and he died down here. But the Bible says, you need to realize also, the Bible says, for God so loved the world. Now, we are not the first people loving. God first did what? Love the world, that he gave his only begotten one. So God manifested love by giving. You understand that? That's beautiful. So love is not about receiving. You know, many people have this kind of ideology or mindset that I want to receive. So I'm like, I was thinking about this before I got married. Like, if I really want a good lady, then I must begin by being a good man. You understand what I'm talking about? The question is not about the woman. The question is about me. Am I a good person? Am I the right person? Am I spiritual? I want someone who is devoted to God. Am I devoted to God? I want someone who dresses well. Am I myself dressing well? I want someone who loves the neighbors and everyone will welcome my family and everyone. Am I doing that myself? So uh, um, someone once said, and this, this can sound strange, that before you marry, you must marry yourself. It's like he was trying to say, you have to come to a point where what you expect your wife to do to you, you can be able to do to others. And so love is more about giving than receiving. But many people see love as I, okay, it's you who I want to do the right, but I don't want you to expect me to do right. So I can do everything I want outside there, but if I find you doing it, I will find something wrong about what you do. And that's why when love is formed with that mindset, it cannot last. So God loved the world, and what did God do? He gave his only begotten son. And then he says that whosoever believeth should not perish, but have everlasting life, all right? So that's interesting, and that's why we are looking at the sanctuary. Did you know? Now, look at the slides as we'll be going through. 
look at what's happening, the statistics for divorce. And you can be able to see that divorce is increasing every other single time, every other single year. As time continues, as marriages are contracted, divorce rate is increasing. And that's why uh, uh, you can be able to see in this line, the divorce rate in America for the first marriage versus the second marriage or third marriage, 50% of first marriages result in divorce. 67% of second marriages result in divorce. 74% of third marriages end in divorce. And so let's talk about first marriages because those are Christians. And we are talking about 50% of divorce. So 50% of succeeding, isn't it? No, that's not what it's saying. Those are the ones who have been counted. That's the statistics that they have. How many people are in a divorce in the same room? You understand? There are so many families, they are not together, but they're living under the same one, the same roof. And they are ashamed. Someone is saying, oh, I'm an elder. How can this happen? I'm, I'm a so-and-so. How can this happen? I was a youth leader. How can this happen? And so they are all already apart. Someone is like thinking about the children, but their mind is not one. Someone is saying the only thing that binds us is these children. Someone is saying the only thing that binds us is the name. Someone is saying the only thing that binds us is this. So there are 50% known statistically marriages that result into divorce. And we should be asking ourselves, Lord, why? When we read these statistics, we need to be a little bit careful, especially in an age where everyone wants to go into marriage. So one person once said, many are aspiring to go in while many are preparing to get out. And people are like, ah, I wish I would, things would be reversed so that you be where I am and be where you are. We have to make right decisions. The problem is not the marriage institution. The problem is the foundation which was laid. And so if the foundation was wrong, then you begin to see the fruits of a wrong foundation, all right? And then it, um, you can be able to see these statistics become realistic. So you can be able to see people exchanging um, uh, words in a way that is not Christian, shouting on one another. You can be able to see children are um, actually um, out of sign. They are, they are in families that are not just... Um, that they cannot just wish uh, they were in there like, um, how shall I live with money alone without daddy and how shall I live with daddy alone without money? There is not one marriage in a hundred that results happily. So how many results are there? When, when she uses that language, there is not one in a hundred marriages that results happily that bears the sanction of God and places, uh, um, as I mean, are places uh, uh, both parties in, um, uh, in a better position. There is not one marriage in a hundred that results happily, that bears the sanction of God and places parties in a position better to glorify God. Basically, you need to understand the way Sister White is writing and speaking. She's not simply saying there is not one marriage that actually glorifies God, no. She's speaking in a general sense. You need to understand that. She's speaking in a general sense. I was able to look at this language when I was studying with us the book of Acts, for those who normally uh, join in uh, the book of Acts. All right. Oh, oh thank you. We're just trying to help those who are around so that they can also watch the projection. Thank you for that. Uh, um, well, that's, that's helpful, isn't it? So, yeah, so we talked about um, the language that Sister White uses. Well, for example, uh, the language is like, there are times when the Bible says uh, that uh, Luke has written all that Jesus Christ did. Is it true that Luke really wrote everything that Jesus Christ did? No. But in a general sense, he wrote to a greater percentage most of the things that Jesus did what? Deed, all right? So what we're trying to say here is very simple. There are many marriages that actually end up miserable. That's what she's saying. 
in a general sense, there is not one marriage in a hundred that results happily, that bears the sanction of God and places the parties in a position to better glorify God. So ideally, if I was a Christian before I got married, then when I get married, then my Christian experience should build. It should grow. Ideally, that's why we get married. We get married so that we can help one another to grow into the image of Jesus Christ. There is no other purpose of getting married. In fact, let me tell you one thing. If you realize that your marriage is not God, your coach, your whatever is not leading you to a place where you will better glorify God, you are not to make a point of even beginning that relationship. You understand? So that's very important. If you realize that I am in entering into a marriage where I think there will be too much calls, there will be too much this, I don't think I can be a better Christian in this environment, then you are not to enter into that relationship. Or even tie yourself by vows <coughs> into that marriage program. Sorry. So I think that's very important for us to remember that the main intention of binding yourself to your partner is for one single purpose, to better glorify God, to form character for eternity, to build yourself into the image of Jesus Christ. So my wife should help me and I should help my wife. All right. And that's what should be happening. All right. Now look at this. <coughs> um, Okay, <clears throat> this is interesting now. The evil consequences of poor marriage are numberless. So the end justifies the means. So we are told that the evil consequences of poor marriages are numberless. They are numberless. We are having single parents because of divorces, poor marriages. We are having children who don't have the benefit of <clears throat> both their parents because of poor marriages and so they cannot grow up in a family that is well ordered with the balanced um, ideas and so on. They are contracted from impulse. You know, I was looking at that and that amazed me that marriages are contracted by impulse. What does that mean? Impulse is whereby we do not and we'll see the steps to marriages number one and two tomorrow. And you realize that many marriages are contracted by impulse. Have you ever gone to a supermarket and you didn't have your <clears throat> list of what you should buy, all right? And then you begin seeing this like, I like this, and I like this, and I like this, and I like this. And so by the end of the day, you've used 10,000. You didn't plan to use that 10,000, you're right. You need impulse buying, all right? <clears throat> That's what people are doing in marriage relations. In courtship, people are actually, they don't have the mind of like, I am ready now, or God has shown me that I should be finding a life partner. So what happens is these brethren <clears throat> or these sisters, they do impulse buying. They meet a man by the road and they say, I think I need to marry this man. They've never prayed about it. They've never asked even God if they are ready to do what? To get married. They went to school to study, isn't it? And one day they were walking in the streets and they saw a lady and their emotions were attracted to that lady. They've never prayed about it. They were not even contemplating to marry. They even didn't know where they are going to live. They did make all these plans. They say, all right, I love you. And you're like, how comes? You understand what, what's happening? These are some of the things that now is called marriages contracted by impulse. A marriage should never be entered into by impulse. No, 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 no. It's entered into by, it's deliberate. Courtship is deliberate. I don't walk here that my mother sent me to the market. I say, no, let's begin courtship. No, that's not it. Courtship is deliberate. It's deliberate. You have been praying about it. You've been doing all these things about it. And when the Lord shows you that woman, you are not making jokes or funds. You are going to ask uh, or ask your parents to be able to see those steps. And it's because you are ready. It's because you're ready for marriage. You don't enter courtship if you are not ready to marry. Those who are entering courtship are ready to marry. That means if the courtship works, they should not say, you know what? I don't think I was ready to marry. I don't think uh, I was ready to to take you in, I think we need to take 10 more years. You understand where the problem is? Many people, do you know why we have very long courtship? I hear people bragging, and then you know we have courted for 10 years. 
I mean, I had people doing that. I don't have a problem with that, but there are many people doing that. But seriously, it, most of them result into that because these people entered into this relationship when they were not ready to get married. And that's why we are told that actually courtship should not be too long because also familiarity does what? Yes, exactly. And so if we continue in that relationship, we are putting ourselves into temptations. If we stretch three years, four years, five years, all this time, and you're saying you courtship and your parents know about it and everything, you're putting yourself into a greater risk. Now, that does not mean that it's marked, it's marked by two years or it must be four years or it must be five years. We'll be able to look at what the Bible says about that, and I'm sure. Uh, our brethren will to speak about it. And then look at what it says. A candid review of the matter is scarcely thought of. So people don't candidly review the matter, isn't it? And then it says, and consultations with those of experience is considered what? Old-fashioned. So I'm not going to talk to any of my elder brethren. I'm not going to talk. <laughs> a brother told me that, hey, someone told me that, no, 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 don't talk to me about that. I'll tell you when that time comes. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> Why should that happen in the first place? Why should it happen? Consultations with people of experience is considered old fashioned. I'm not going to consult my parents. I'm not going to talk with the pastor about it. I'm not going to talk with the elders about it. When do we really talk these things out with spiritual leaders? We talk it out when everything is ready and we, our minds cannot be changed, isn't it? When I cannot change my mind, you understand my sister? When you cannot change your mind, in fact, if the elder try to say is no, is the one whom you are going to dispense it. There is no question about you changing. That's when people actually begin seeking for counsel. And of what help is counsel when you are already settled? You understand what I'm talking about? So when someone is already settled, I'm gonna do this, I'm, and then they like go to the pastor, pastor, we want to get married, and so begin counseling what? Counseling us. They're already settled. They've already put money, they want to go mar get married and all these things that are just seeking for counsel. That's not it, my friend. You should seek counsel. And candidly, and that's what you are told. And, and it's, 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 it's something that is most neglected by youths and it's because they consider it old fashioned. I mean, for what reason should I uh, consult uh, my parent? Okay? Uh, what reason? You understand? All right, I was, I was one time, I was in college, I called my mother and I asked my mother, uh, would you be comfortable if I marry someone who's not of my tribe? I just want to find out. Would it be a cancel on that, right? Yeah, I, I wanted to find out, you know, I mean, like my son, okay, that would be fine, but what if I cannot speak Swahili and I cannot speak English and I can only speak uh, your mother tongue? What will I do in case there's a problem? I mean, will I just go to these people and just keep her and like, she has a point. You understand? She was just sharing ideas. I'm not saying that, that, that there is no difference now, but she was sharing ideas. In other words, I want to know what my parent is saying about this thing. You understand? So I can go consult with an elder. I can go consult with a pastor. I can go, I mean, with different people, depending on what the Lord shows us is right. Okay, let's continue. Um, Courtship as carried in what age? This age. It's a scheme of deception and what? Hypocrisy. Huh? Yes, it's a scheme of deception and hypocrisy with which the enemy of soul has far more to do than the what? Who is largely controlling the courtships of the day? Son. And then he says, good common sense is needed here if anywhere. Common sense, all right? I've heard people tell us or say that, you know, I just want a strict scripture on this, isn't it? Well, I want you to say this. Look, the prophet says there are things that common sense will help you to do what? To understand. For example, the Bible does not talk about cigarette, isn't it? There is no word cigarette in the Bible. But yet common sense will tell you if you smoke cigar, you are violating a commandment of God, which says thou shalt not kill. You understand? You'll never find that word cigar or bang in the Bible, right? 
So common sense and those who are in connection with God, God will impress in their senses what is right to do, all right? Yes, that's exactly what, in marriage, there are a lot of things you'll not explicitly find stated as, you, as stated there, right? But you can be sure that if you're in a connection with God, you'll apply what is called common sense to everything. But then she says that common sense, good common sense is needed here, if any, but the fact is it has little to do in this matter. So there is no common sense here. You're like, why don't you see it, all right? But I don't see it. Many people are not seeing it and you're like, why don't these people see it? I'll tell you why. It's because they are infatuated. And we'll be able to explain that word in a wider way. They are not principled. They have not entered this thing, but they have, their emotions have been lightly tapped into that they feel like this is not reversible. Okay, look at this. Okay. <clears throat> Saturn is busily engaged, uh, is busily engaged in influencing those who are only unsuited to what? What is the biggest work of Saturn? Is busy, is engaged in influencing those who are not only un, who are who, those who are only unsuited to each other to unite their interest. That's what Saturn wants. Is looking for all right, all right, all right. You could be all going to the same church, and that's fine, dear youth. You could be all in the same college, that's fine, doing the same course, that's interesting. From the same tribe, that's interesting. The biggest work of the devil is to unite two men who are two, I mean, man and woman who are not suited, uh, who are only unsuited to each other, and then he unites their interests, all right. They are wholly unsuited. Now, when will they realize that they are unsuited? Will they realize it today in courtship? Certainly not. Why can they not realize it in courtship? Because they don't have what is called discernment. Is discernment something we need to pray for? Exactly. Because the Bible says, buy of me, I shall. You understand? Why is Laodicea told to buy, I shall? Laodicea cannot see their true condition. You understand? And do you know that Laodicea is just a larger description of a church, but did you know that the home can be in a Laodicean condition? Individuals can be in a Laodicean condition, whereby the individual does not see mistakes that they are making, all right? And so they are saying, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, all things are good. This is a good woman, I love her, she's educated, she has papers, uh, she can support, she has a job, she has all, she's seeing all the good things, but they're not seeing the wretchedness that is there, all right? And so the devil wants to unite those people like never before. And you know, he says, he exalts himself in this work, all right? If he can destroy, your family, he can destroy your influence, all right? If he can destroy a minister's family, he can destroy the influence. If he can destroy a movement, he can destroy their influence. If it can destroy marriages in a church, he can destroy their influence. Think about a church where everyone is being accused of unfaithfulness. How much can they preach the three angels message? Think about a church where every man and woman is accused of laying or raising their hands at their wives. A man is accused of raising his hand over his wife. How much of the third angel's message can they preach? They'll come to the world and the world will tell them, you know what? I don't go to church, but I have never done what? I have never beat my wife, you understand? So the devil understands that if I can get this all wrong, I can destroy their influence completely. And so the devil will try to unite them and then bind them, and then he will exalt himself. So the Bible says, and Peter, uh, Paul writes that we are, we are wise, and so we cannot be deceived of his what? His devices. We must notice the devices of Saturn. So if there's a place that we need to be careful is on this, and then he says, um, um, and uh, for by it, he can produce more misery and hopeless woe to the human family than by exercising his skills in any other direction. The greatest war to human family, right? Because if we have a family that's broken, then children who are brought up cannot be rightly trained for God. And so there is war 
there is trouble. There is all these things. Just as long as Saran can do it. Friends, I think this is serious. And I'm thinking about that. That's really serious. So what's really the purpose of marriage? The purpose of marriage is blending two different personalities into the image of God. Blending two different personalities into the image of God. And so that means the more I live with my dear wife, the more we should look like Jesus Christ. That's what I want it to be like because that's what God wants it to be like. The purpose of marriage is not just for you to get children, all right? The purpose for marriage is not just the woman to leave their home and come to your home, all right? The great purpose of marriage is to blend two different personalities into the image of Jehovah. All right? That's important for you to understand. And that's why the Bible says, they, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. What does it mean to cleave unto the wife? That phrase, or rather, that term cleave used there, do you know what it means? That term cleave means to be bonded together inseparably. So that's why the Bible says what God has put together, let no man do what? Put asunder. It's like an alloy. How, how easy is it to separate an alloy? It's not easy, isn't it? So that's why the Bible says, and I want you to share with me, uh, uh, my sister, you're here. I want you to share with me. Jesus Christ, he loved the world. What did he do? He died. He was crucified. And the Bible says that husbands love your wife as Christ did what? Love the church. How much love? Do we contemplate about those verses? Or we just read them passing? How much love did Christ show to the church? He was ready to die for the world. And do you know why? Because Christ wanted to present a spotless church to the Father. You understand that? And so a committed husband should love the wife. She, could be, she can make some mistakes, and I'm not talking about this, uh, this other side. But ideally, his burden, the burden of Jesus Christ, for loving the church and giving his life was not for to pass time, but was to present as living, a spotless church. And that's why when you're falling in, uh, rather, rather rising to love, not falling into love, we don't fall in love. We rise to love. Now, when you're rising to love, you need to understand that the great purpose is so that you might be able to present your home as a spotless church to the Father. And many people always read and say, you know what, the Bible says, and women submit yourself, you have done, praise the Lord for that. But before the Bible mentions women, the Bible says, submit yourself one to another. Have you ever read that in verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 5? It begins by saying, submit yourself, every one of you, one to what? Another. And so that's why Christ submitted himself. At the same time, while submitting himself, he said, what do you mean? Didn't Christ wash the feet of his disciples? Are you getting it? You know, you're like, what do you mean? Yes, you know, when, uh, when, we, we, when we transferred to Transmara, and we were going to the river with my wife, and us, we don't know how to carry stuff on our back. So I carry that bucket, that door, on my head, and we go down to the door, and Sai's are like, hey, this guy is crazy, or his wife is controlling him, and he's doing all the same thing. We would go like four, five, six, seven times to the spring and collect water and bring it all the way to the house. And he'd go with her and come back, go with her and come back, go with her and come back. And when it submit yourself one to another, all right? If I love her so much, I must be willing to submit also. And she is to be willing to submit. She is to love, I am to love. You understand now? And the great reason for this is so that we can be able to present our family, our little boy, our, our parents, all the people who come into our home to Jehovah, all right? That's interesting. Okay, so we can be able to just look at a, a few more. God decides that every Christian home, God decides that every Christian home in its harmony, peace, and love should be a model of the home where? In heaven. Doesn't it? Should be a model of the home in heaven. Our homes, 
should be a model. I don't even think that I am yet there. I don't know about you people. But we should be praying that our homes should be a model of the home in heaven. Amen? In fulfillment of this ideal, there can be no marriage with unbelievers, for in homes established under the unequal yoke, the shadows are never lifted. All right? Okay. All right. Sister White says, you each have an identity of your own, but in that identity, there must be a what? A unity. And so that's very important. The reason why we read of those numberless divorces was because we do not understand this subject of unity. And that's one thing I want to look at before we close this session. There is constantly to be a development of the faculties that God has given you, that you may improve, 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 and that you may indeed be looked upon by the heavenly angels with the commendation. And then he says, you are not called to give up your identity. You each have an identity of your own. This may not always run in the very same channel, and yet there may be that blending that God requires. What's that blending? This is something we talk about in gospel order. Unity in what? Diversity, all right? And this is something that we need to understand. If we are calling for unity, that one in the gospel order, that one that we, Jesus Christ prayed for, that the church might be what? One, then we must experience it in the home. All right? So the home is the foundation. It's the first church. It's the first school. So we are talking about unity in church, unity in doctrine, unity in all these things when we can't be united in our own homes. You understand? And it's something that we need to strive, pray about, and ask God, are we united in our thoughts, ideas, and minds? All right? We have an individuality of our own, and the wife's individuality is never to be sung. Uh, uh, to be sunk into that of our husband. God is our creator. We are uh, is by creation. We are is and we are is by redemption. All right. We want to see how much we can render back to God because he gives us moral power. He gives us efficiency. He gives us the intellect and he wants us to make the most of these precious gifts to his glory. All right. So uh, we are ideally called to be perfect. How? as our Father who is in heaven is perfect. So to most Christians, this text is interpreted to mean try to be perfect, but you never will be perfect. That exact mentality is brought into the marriage world, experience, union. And what happens is there are people who don't believe that a marriage can glorify God, isn't it? There are young men who believe that you'll always make mistakes. They don't believe that they can keep themselves pure, isn't it? They don't believe that they can overcome the lusts of the flesh. Oh, yes, because I also once believed that. But thank God that Jesus was able to show me in the gospel that all things are possible through Christ that strengthens me. And so what I've come to believe is there can be mountains before me, but I know through the grace of God I can be able to overcome it. You understand what I'm saying? So many youths don't believe I can remain pure. They don't believe that they can make... Uh, and we'll be able to see because as we'll be presenting, you'll find some things are a little bit difficult, isn't it? Yeah, because like when I was getting married, I was like, how will I approach the parents uh, when I was in courtship? Uh, uh, I want to get into courtship with this sister. How will I approach what? I need courage, isn't it? Because we'll, that was a, a tough one, because the world do not believe that you should go to a, a lady's parents and, and say that I want, to, I, want, I want to be friends with your wife, with your daughter. But I mean, I mean they, they think that you should be going when you're now ready to marry, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? That's what the world believes. And that was actually heavy, okay? But do you know that when you read the beautiful promise that all is possible through Christ who strengthens you. So who is going to give me the strength? Christ is going to put every word in my mouth. It's going to show everything to me that I'll say. In fact, the Bible says that think not what you'll say on that day. Angels will remind you. The spirit of the Father which is in you. Amen. So I am sure that if we surrender ourselves to God, the things that we'll be learning this week will make sense. 
Some may say no, they might not make sense, but the few who will decide to take them will experience a beautiful marriage because a beautiful marriage is not a mansion. I'm telling you, I have seen mansion. I have seen, I'm not talking about hearing. Mansion is where people fight every night. All right? They're fighting. They can agree. I've seen mansion. The people cheat in those mansions. The very bed, matrimonial bed you bought with hundreds of thousands. You understand? You know, that's where unfaithfulness is practiced. So I'm telling you that the only thing that can keep a, happy, a marriage happy is God's wonderful gospel. That in itself is a sure proof. All right. Let's read a few quotes on this subject of unity and then just hang it there. When I look at this <laughs> with the Bible, uh, the Spirit of Prophecy says, All right, this is Brother Colin Standish, and I don't believe everything he believes, but I think I agree with him on this one. And this is very interesting. He says, By a true union, but a true union is built upon unity. That bond in which there is no area of separation between those united together. If young people would study the experience of Pentecost in Acts chapter 1, true, they will reflect that about 120 people are united. So we should study more of Acts chapter 2, isn't it? Yeah, so we are, you know, many people are interested about this idea of marriage and everything. While I was in college, every marriage seminar was packed. Prophecy, zero. All these things, zero. I'll tell you one thing. If you don't love the other segments of God's love, if you don't love to study these other segments, you can never know what it's all about true unity. And so we are told that we should study the Pentecost experience. I don't know how many of you who are entering into courtship in courtship contemplating or whatever stage you are in. I don't know how many of you are having that idea of the Pentecost. Isn't that brilliant? That's amazing to me. Because when I was going through this, it was amazing that God calls me to understand what was happening in Pentecost. All right, look at this. In Pentecost, they removed all differences, all sins. So I am telling you that when we are entering into a relationship that leads to marriage, we should even be confessing our sins, repenting. We should be getting closer to God. All right, success in marriage is certainly a union built upon unity. The same argument regarding divisive principles that brings unity in a group of Christian believers is necessary for unity in a marriage. And so that's very important. And I think you need to take that point home. You need to take its building, its unity built upon unity. Unity in what? In doctrine, in thought, in faith, in all those things. For how can two walk together except they do what? They do agree, all right? But unity, however, does not mean that we are always to think exactly there. It doesn't mean when we turn right, we must always turn right. I said this, that's not unity, all right? Yeah, unity is bigger than that, right? However, it entails both spouses having their lives in unbroken commitment to their what? their savior. He are uh, allowing him to perfect his character in their lives. In his prayer for unity, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is the word. So my sister and my brother, it is the word of God that is going to shape your relationship. The moment you put the word of God aside or out, you can count it a broken relationship. Because when you break the relationship between the father, between you and heaven, you have ideally broken the relationship between you and your first part. The only binding factor, let me tell you, in 1888 papers, it's written Christ in you and Christ in me that binds us. Christ in you attracts Christ in me. How does Christ dwell in us? He dwells in us through his indwelling word. All right? And so the word of God in you, the sanctifying word of God, will draw what to the both of us together. And that's very interesting. All right? Okay. <laughs> he says, here again we notice some principles uh, which bring true unity. Uh, where it's written in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. <clears throat> Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the spirit and to unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervent. How do you love one another? 
with a pure heart fervently. You must purify your souls by obeying the word, obeying the truth. So we are told obeying the truth through the spirit and to unfiend or without pretense. How many love is a pretense? A lot of it. Young people, can you see that these are the principles upon which every true Christian marriage should be established? It should be established upon purity of conscience. All right? Purity of conscience. Uh, all right. You must understand that if both husband and wife are daily seeking the power of Christ's grace to live this life, then the marriage will be invincible. Amen. Some believe that this is a noble goal, but that it cannot be done well. Huh? That's good, but it cannot happen. Right? However, the Bible does not support such a discouraging conclusion. Some believe that the Bible statements such as I can of mine own self do nothing absolve them of any thought to seek perfection of character. Yet it is from Jesus that we are assured that with God all things are done what are possible. The issue of perfection has nothing to do with the abject weakness of fallen humanity or human beings. It has all to do with Christ dwelling within us, accepting Christ to dwell in us by his spirit, by his word, that is it, having the power enough to change us. By surrender. My son, give me your word, your heart. That's the first step that we must make. We must surrender our hearts to Jesus Christ. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was in whom? In Jesus Christ. The mind of Christ must be in us. And that mind is the mind that caused Christ to come down. He humbled himself. Whereby giving us exceedingly great and precious promises that by this you might be partakers of Christ's divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. We must escape the corruptions that are in this world through lust. If we say it is impossible to live a life of character perfection, we will certainly never achieve it. If we say that I can never come to a point where I can live a marriage that will never have an attempt of separation, then it will not be possible. Because you become what you have set your mind to believe. You understand? If you believe that Christ can give you strength, then Christ can suddenly give you strength. All right? And there are principles you are going to need to form um, as you contemplate. And that's why during the contemplation time, it's time of much prayer and much study, amen, and much counsel. There are three things that happen during contemplation. During contemplation, that is when now after which you don't make deliberate or you don't make impulse decisions. You make deliberate work. So when you're contemplating to marry, you are praying, isn't it? You are studying the word of God to know. Because how does God answer our prayers? God answers our prayers in accordance with his why? So we ideally help God to answer our prayers. I'll tell you why. If I'm praying that God may help me to get food, then I'm really studying how to do work my farm. You understand? And then God will bless the work I'm doing in my farm. I'm planting bananas the right way, isn't it? I'm planting maize the right way. I am timing the rains and everything and all these things. So I am cooperating with God and God helps me by answering my prayers so that I have a bumper harvest. But well, can I sit back and ask God to answer my prayer of giving me food and sit in the house, wake late and lazy myself and then go to the farm and find huge bananas? It's going to work that way. It's not going to work that way. So I'm going to be studying the will of God. God is going to tell me this is what I need in a virtuous woman. And this is what I need in a faithful man. And so you are going to study this and study this and study this. You are not going to just wander around the world looking for someone to marry. No, you are going to see those principles in someone's life. Amen. And when you are seeing those principles in someone's life, there is another thing that is called divine impression. Because there is a lot of hypocrisy in this world. You need divine impression, which comes also with discernment, isn't it? There are things that someone can see that you cannot see. And you're like, okay, how did that happen? God can impress in your mind that this is not the right thing to do. Yes. Yes. 
God can give you a divine impression. Impressions of the Holy Spirit. And another way in which God speaks to us is through providence, isn't it? Providence. God can provide a wife to you through a mature Christian who has known someone and knows you and God through providence unites you together and this brother or sister who loves God and you know them an elder pastor and so on he tells you that I know so and so is a lovely God fearing man and I know so and so is a lovely God fearing man and I think that you people can be united in marriage you understand because you've been praying and God has through providence all right and this is a man who loves God and you both know him that he loves God and is orderly in his family, isn't it? And you just, just don't go to a man and say, I, I think you need to get married to so-and-so. You look at his family and you are like, does he understand? Does he want me to build my family on the breast he has built his family, you understand? So you must know that it's someone whom you can do what? Trust to guide you even in your family experience, all right? All right, something that you can be able to think about. Okay, it says, we understand that, um, well, um, yeah, sure, it says, we understand that is exactly, um, uh, that is exactly the same principle which is seen what is said by so many husbands and wives about their marriages, isn't it? They don't believe that their marriages can be a good example to the side. They don't believe. Say so they confess there is no hope we cannot learn how to agree and continue to live together. And if you conclude this, you are expressing a self-fulfilling prophecy. You must have hope that God can restore even our broken relationships. God can restore them. But if we are not yet in one, we must have the hope and foundation that God can be able to unite us in relationships that will never be shackled by the devices of Satan. And it all begins by us expressing our willingness to surrender our hearts to Jesus Christ. For Christ cannot by force bring us into obedience. But when we surrender our hearts, we can be sure that Christ can fulfill or do great things um, uh, through us. As you allow your mind to wander in the direction, you suddenly will never find God's plan to bring about unity, love, and harmony in your marriage. Then we are told, and listen to this, um, uh, what I'm, I'm reading. The more we express this hopelessness, the deeper its expression. For expression inevitably deepens what? Impression. I cannot live with him. I cannot live with him. I'm tired. The more you express this expression, the more you tell your wife, I'll beat you, you are putting that impression and you will execute it. And so the more you mention these things, the more you, are, you will be coming closer to putting them into action. You become increasingly convinced of the impossibility of a happy and contented marriage. Thus, step by step, you yield to temptation to fracture the marriage bond. I think that was beautiful by uh, this guy from Heartland College. Long before marriage, you must realize the infinite power of Christ, amen, and his grace day by day and moment by moment. If you've never realized it, if you don't know what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus, if you don't know how to pray and have your personal devotions, if you don't know how to study your own Bible, if you don't know how to do all these things, marriage is not going to improve it or to rather unexpectedly instill it into you. I asked someone, what do you think happens on the day that you exchange vows? You think there is something flashing into you that changes you all of a sudden? There is nothing that happens. You know, people think that like when I am taking those vows, then I'm appending that signature or whatever they're telling you, well, appending. man, God is just going to flash some love, faithfulness, kindness, meekness. I'm just going to be the latest, brand new, best husband in the sea. And then they realize that after two days, they're the same people they were three days ago. And that's something you need to come here. But it says, 
On number of occasions, Christ provides the perfect formula. When Christ is in us, we are in Christ, we are invisible, the fiery darts of Satan fail. And of course, you can talk about unity, which is in Christ. I don't want to talk about this because we must be one with uh, our, 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 our down here as the Father is one with the Son. All right. <clears throat> Let me, um, um, we've been going through this. I want to go through that short now. Um, the children of Israel, they came to a point where their source of destruction that led them to idolatry was always based on the issue of forming wrong relations. And I've talked about this, that youths, we need to study the story of this man who was called Samson. He was an Israelite, two of us. He was an Israelite, and in studying his life, his life is Samson was born in a special way to fulfill a duty. And what was that duty? To rescue the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines, isn't it? But what happened? He forgot his duty. How many young Seventh-day Adventist men forget their calling and their duty? You understand? How many young Christians forget their calling and their duty? And then they mess up. He was a strong man. He had dreadlocks. But he didn't understand that his strength was not in the dreadlocks. His strength was not in the muscles or in the six-pack, the eight-packs or whatever you have, you know. His strength was not in any of those, right? Where was his strength? You know, there was a young man who killed Goliath. He didn't have a lot of muscles. He didn't have a lot of dreads. What was his name? David. And as long as you surrender and you're under the control of God, you are strong. You understand? He didn't understand that his strength was in fidelity, commitment, and faithfulness to God. All right? And many of us, you can be a powerful preacher, that's all right. You can quote text, that's all right. But you fail miserably. And you know why you fail? It's because when you're weak morally, then you're the weakest man in the world. You understand what I just say? Moral weakness constitutes weakness. A man who cannot control himself is not a strong man. He's a weak man. And so do you know one of the characters that is known to be very weak in the Bible is Samson. Samson was a very weak man. What was he doing? He was tearing lions down, you understand? Cutting gates, you understand? Tying, I don't know what, what are those things? Tail to tail. He was doing some, some funny things that appeared huge. They were going crazy, all right? But it did constitute strength, all right? He failed in the most basic, most important, that was self-control. And the Bible says, love not the world or the things of this world. But if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We have to overcome the lusts of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eye, all right? But he failed there. He loved the world. And anyone who loves the world is at enmity with God, all right? And many young people who forget their main, why God is calling them, fail where Samson failed. What did Samson tell his father? Get me this woman of Timna, isn't it? Because I have loved her. All right? Did the father counsel Samson against marrying that woman? The father did counsel him. In fact, the father said, don't we have a maiden of our own want? of our own tribe, of our own people, all right? But he said, get me her because I have done what? She pleased me, I have loved her. He did not, was not willing to heed to counsel of the father. And in failing to heed the counsel of the father, what happened? He failed in the most important duty, all right? He failed in the most important duty. He did not fulfill his purpose. What happened? A man who was supposed to deliver Israel was now a slave in the temple of Dagon without his two highest. Isn't that sad? And that's our history. So we need to think about these things, why it is so important. 
And do you know, it began with a simple entering into that marriage by informing his parents, excuse me, in his second interactions with Delilah after the death of his first wife. Question. When he entered into marriage with Delilah, and I call it marriage, whatever you call it, did he inform his parents? Did he go and consult with his parents that I want to find a woman and her name is Delilah? No, because he knew that the parents would not agree with, with it. You understand? And I'm thinking that a time comes when, when you begin to reject counsel, it's possible you're not going to ask counsel. Isn't it? Because you know that the counsel is going to be against you. Let me give you a story in the Bible that will really interest me, especially. Those online others, you know the story of this man called Micaiah and Ahab. Have you ever read about that story? What did Micaiah tell Ahab the first time? <laughs> Micaiah told Ahab, you go to the war and you'll be able to win the war, isn't it? But was that the truth? That was not the truth. And then it was like, I know, because even if I tell him to do it, he's not going to do it because Ahab is headstrong, all right? He wants to do what he believes he wants to do. He doesn't want to hear the voice of God. He's committed to that. And then so... So go ahead. And so a man who was strong, born, his birth was announced by an angel. Just imagine. An angel came down. This is it announced a boy shall be born. It was huge. That man was found now serving in the temple. And we could all right now be serving in those temples. We don't have our eyes. I have always advised young sisters young brothers. In fact, young sisters, I've told them, you know, it is better for you to walk down the streets without a carry air, without anything on your head, than to lose your substance. Have you ever lost your substance? Where, I mean, everyone looks at you and like, she's cheap, isn't it? Walking down the road. She's Frivolous. She's someone who is not, loves jesting. I mean, no one respects you, all right? You've lost your substance. You've been abused. Your heart has been broken a couple number of times. Which one is better? Walking down the road with a Cali air when you don't have self-esteem or walking down the road when you are confidence, happy, I mean, um, fearfully and wonderfully made uh, because you are sure or whatever, you understand? I want to walk down on my foot without a car, but people can say he's a man of principle, all right? I don't want to drive and they see my car and they're like, hey, look at that guy. He's a man who cannot keep in his house, you understand? He's a man who can, I mean, I want to have my substance. And, and these stories are all new to me because the prodigal son lost his substance. And people think he only lost what? Money. Hello, it's not about money. You can walk the college, streets of the college, and you know what? You have no substance. And I've told young ladies, men can use you, and when you lose your substance, they give you up. They give you up. Because that's exactly what they do. That's why Samson lost his substance. Where were the ladies that was hanging up? Who are they? He finally had to call on God. I have sometimes received calls on people who are calling upon God and asking me, brother, pray with me. My marriage is in trouble. They did consider God at the onset of their marriage. They considered every counsel from soap opera. Now these things cannot solve real problems. You understand what I'm talking about? They cannot solve real problems, all right? You saw the flashy car in a soap opera and you're like, I think my husband should buy that sports. And then you saw that flashy house mansion and you say, I need a husband with that. And that was not practical. You understand? It was not practical. And you're like, all right. I saw that lady was beautiful. By the way, when you fall, oh, many people fall in love. But tell me, when you fall in love, or rather when 
you because that happens so it's also fall in love. Do you ever think that that beautiful woman you are seeing one day can be crippled and be on a wheelchair? Do you ever think about that? I was told a story of a man. Someone was telling me, and this lady, she went through a very nasty experience, got a mercy, and then I think she had her womb removed. They were in a relationship with a man. The man really loved her. When the womb was removed, the man said, I'm going to marry this woman. All right? In fact, I'll tell you one thing. Young people, you need to be very serious. One day I was checking, I'll not mention names, but I like to use practical experiences to teach people so that people don't think they're teaching theory, all right? I was getting, I was preparing Brother Sami to take a brother uh, to go to the parents. And at night, I mean, I put my tie ready, I put everything ready. I got a call and say, I'm, I'm not going there tomorrow. And I asked, what on earth? And then when I find out, it's because someone told her, oh, that lady is sick. And I asked the sister, did you get this disease yesterday? And she's like, no, I've been sick, and he knew. Okay, I loved you, but because of that disease, he turned away, and that's good, because if it came in marriage, he would have done the same thing. And so that's possibly that if she sees, he sees another woman, he will do that same thing just when he realize something he didn't know. So perhaps if the wife gets an accident and doesn't have her hands, he may have to be unfaithful. Because he'll be like, I cannot wash all the good plates and all these things. Yes, that's happening. And so that's what the devil wants our marriages to be like. Friends of Jesus, young and old, I want us to understand our only hope is in giving our hearts to the Lord. But that's what constitutes a good and a happy marriage. That marks the first presentation on this subject. God bless you till we meet in the next presentation in Jesus Christ's name. I will pray and then we'll give time for asking of uh, questions and around uh, interaction and then we'll be able to, I'll pray. Let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, dear God, for good time to speak and interact together. We are so thankful you are good and you're speaking to us in a still small voice. We want to hear what it is that you're saying to us. So keep blessing us and keep blessing the dear people that are in this forum in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.